good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This afternoon for our LNG sector, we have a very distinguished panel. And in addition to that, we have a very good opportunity to have some opening remarks. Um, we, have a, we look forward to a very good discussion on the LNG shipping. And, but before we be, begin, I'd like to introduce Michael D. Tustiani. Mr. Tustiani was the chairman emeritus, I'm sorry, emeritus of Potent and Partners, and he joined Potent in 1973. He served as the chairman and chief executive officer from 1983 to 2016. He's published many books, articles, and co-authored many um, additional uh, uh, um, books associated with the oil and gas industry. So please welcome and please join me in welcome, welcoming Mr. Michael D. Tussiani. Thank you. Thank you, Roy, and good afternoon. Uh, today, we are in an unprecedented time in the LNG industry. In the space of just three years, we've had two black swan events, the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. These, especially the latter, have put LNG on the front page of the geopolitical stage. The media is giving LNG almost daily coverage making it a household name in many countries. During the last two decades, the LNG market has enjoyed enormous growth. From barely 100 million metric tons in 2000 to over 400 million at the end of 2022. That's a six and a half percent average annual growth rate. And in comparison, Oil during that same period rose only by one and a half percent. About 75 percent of LNG is sold under long term contracts, priced mainly against oil. The remainder is sold under short term or spot contracts, priced against gas or LNG markets. These prices skyrocketed. At a point last year, the differential between U.S. Gulf Coast prices and those in Europe became so large that a value of a single cargo soared to about $200 million. This allowed sellers to pay a spot rate, a daily spot rate, of $400,000 or more and amazingly, without too much hesitation. <laughs> this still generated over $100 million of profit on the transaction. European and Asian prices have since fallen, but a substantial profit potential exists. However, how do these rosy numbers mask an uncertain future. How much can the LNG trade grow? Is there enough global demand? And at what price? Let me, let me emphasize a critical point. All energy moves at a price. I repeat, all energy moves at a price. Will consumers in the growth markets such as China, India, and Pakistan, still favor LNG over coal and oil at today's high prices? Given today's uncertainties, will new LNG export facilities be needed? And if so, where will they be built? The United States will soon surpass Qatar as the world's largest exporter. U.S. LNG is by far more flexible because buyers have no destination restrictions and no firm volume commitments. However, will Henry Hub prices remain relatively low over the long run? 
Could U.S. politicians change the rules? I remind everyone that they have done it before in the late 70s and early 80s, transforming the gas industry in the process. Will renewables and other emerging energy sources such as hydrogen, ammonia, or resurgence of nuclear and coal slow LNG's growth? While renewables are already competitive in many markets, let me point out that the cost of these new sources will be much more expensive than conventional fuels. Will consumers be able to afford them, or will governments be forced to provide high levels of subsidy? Even as today's world focuses on energy security, once the Ukraine crisis is resolved, will environmental concerns move to the center of the debate? How will LNG, a fossil fuel, fit in a decarbonizing world? LNG as such has not yet become commoditized. However, in my opinion, LNG shipping has. Unlike the oil trade, where you can purchase a cargo and feel relatively assured that you will find a tanker at a market rate, in LNG trading, that is not the case. A trader needs to have ships in their hands to play in the LNG game. To illustrate, if you enter a casino, you need to draw chips in order to play. So what we have recently seen is a trading company either purchases the cargo or sublets its vessel to others, whichever provides <coughs> the most profitable outcome. This should remain the case as long as the shipping market is tight. Let me point out an interesting fact that prior to the pandemic, most forecasters predicted one-third of LNG would go to Europe. In 2022, two-thirds arrived there. Ton miles have been substantially reduced. So I ask, why is the shipping market tight? Is there an actual shortage of LNG vessels? Or is this market tightness a result of new demand stemming from the commoditization of LNG ships. Some owners are optimistic, ordering vessels for 2027 deliveries at today's prices, now over $260 million, while others have been hesitant. Interestingly, the first 138,000 cubic meter steam vessel built in Japan and delivered to gutter gas 27 years ago in 1996, had a yard cost of $275 million. And that is over $550 million in today's dollars. Are the more cautious owners waiting for yard prices to fall? Or do they feel today's strong charter rates cannot last? It appears that the ideal ship size of the future, around 174,000 cubic meters, and the preferred type of propulsion, the two-stroke engine, have been determined. Although methane slip still needs to be addressed. Are owners waiting to see what develops before deciding on continuing their investment in the LNG sector? What happens if, Ukraine, if the Ukraine crisis ends today? Or to the other extreme, a prolonged war leads to a global conflict? Either of these scenarios will profoundly impact everyone in the industry. Should ship owners be extremely cautious 
because of this uncertainty? Well, today your panel consists of very knowledgeable individuals, all active in the business. I am certain they will have strong opinions on the questions I raised and those your moderator will ask. It should lead to a very lively and informative discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Really appreciate that. Really appreciate you setting the stage for a very nice discussion. I realize now I may not introduce myself when I first came up. I'm Roy Bleiber with the American Bureau of Shipping, and it truly is my pleasure to be here to moderate this panel. Um, so what I'd like to do initially is um, maybe, maybe we give a, a minute for um, each of the gentlemen to give a description and, and the, uh, a profile of the company, in a company fleet, if you want. Um, so first, uh, Jerry Calagritos. Calagritios, I apologize, my Texas accent doesn't work so well. Um, so Jerry, why don't you give us a real brief um, update on your company, please? Of course, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, Capital Product Partners um, is a um, NASDAQ-listed company, uh, owns uh, seven LNG carriers in the water in addition to a number of container vessels, all of them on long-term charters. And uh, in addition to that, um, Capital Maritime and Trading, the, the sponsor of uh, CPLP, owns another uh, 13 ships, a combination of uh, ships in the water and uh, new builds. And we're actually one of those guys that have ordered ships uh, up to 2027. Thank you. Next, we have Richard Terrell with Coolco. Richard? Thank you. Hi. My name is Richard Terrell, and I'm the CEO of Coolco. I think for this audience, the best way to describe Coolco is flex LNG with, with upside. <laughs> we <laughs> listed in New York on Friday, uh, and uh, that's going to give the U.S. investor base access. Uh, obviously, the U.S. investor base is uh, much larger than the Norwegian investor base. The Norwegian investors are good shipping investors, uh, as are many of the U.S. investors, but the U.S. investors also look at the dividend, and they also look at uh, the energy uh, space. And uh, right now, uh, we have a dividend yield of about 13%, and we have the growth which will come from the rechartering of our legacy vessels on higher rates, and new bills, which are due to deliver at the end of next year. And uh, that's why I describe Coolco CLCO as a ticker as ethyl NG with upside. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Next, we have Gordon Shear with Potent. Potent and Partners uh, leads, for many people, a little introduction. We are one of the world's leading LNG ship brokers. In addition to that, we run the world's largest LNG consulting practice and a major business intelligence service in LNG. Alongside that, we have tankers, LPG, and a whole host of other products and, and brokerage services that we're active in. Thank you, Gordon. And we also have Carl Frederick Stabo from Golar LNG. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Carl Stabo. I'm the CEO of Golar LNG. We're a NASDAQ-listed LNG company with a market cap of around $2.4 billion. We are the only uh, pure play FLNG service provider, or the only FLNG service provider in the world. So if you think about the LNG value chain, we are part of the liquefaction, and we're the only one who provides floating liquefaction as a service. We delivered the world's first FLNG in 2018, and it has the best operational track record of any FLNG in the world since. We will take delivery and start a 20-year contract for our second unit this year for a contract to BP that will unlock uh, a backlog of $3 billion of EBITDA to Golar. We currently have around $1 billion of cash. We have no net debt, uh, and the company is in a position to grow within uh, FLNG. That's our focus. The company has been through a fairly large turnaround and simplification process in the last 18 months, including spinning off our shipping fleet into cool company. Uh, so we're very excited about the, the market outlook and uh, the growth of FLNG going forward. Thank you very much, Carl. I appreciate that. So we'll begin into the questions. I think this first question I'm going to point toward Gordon. Um, as, as we all heard, Michael had a very good uh, 
a summary of what his opinion is, specifically with regard to the fact that LNG shipping has become commoditized, but LNG the commodity has not. I did actually notice from the, his recent book, LNG After the Pandemic, which Gordon uh, co-wrote, co-authored, there was a, even in the book they talked about the debate because of that. So with that, Gordon, I'll lead it to you to explain a little bit more what you actually think and whether you agree with actually with Michael. <laughs> well, it would be very awkward if I didn't agree with Michael right, having that's written right. a book that oh, we apparently that's agreed right. on the text. <laughs> so let's, let's take the two pieces of the, of the question. One is, is LNG a commodity like crude oil or even LPG or many other fuels in the, in, in the hydrocarbon space? And the answer, I would argue, is no. LNG is really a bifurcated market. It may even be trifurcated. Uh, on the one hand, we have 70, over 70% 70 of the LNG in the world is traded on long-term contracts. Nearly all of them are indexed to oil. Mm -hmm. And so during maybe the average of 2022, uh, the average imported price of LNG into Japan might have been 13% of a $100 barrel of oil or around $13. And that 75% of the LNG in the world is moving at 13. But the headlines go to the TTF and JKM prices, which last year at their peak hit $75 a million BTU. I would, propose, I would suggest strongly that a market that can trade the same commodity for $75 on the one hand and $13 on the other is hardly a commodity in the sense of the word. And, and fundamentally, that reflects the fact that in the Asian markets in particular, less so in Europe and certainly not at all in North America, natural gas is not a liquid, transparent, traded commodity that we would be familiar with in the North American context until, until and unless it ever is. And by the way, we'd footnote here that Japan and Korea have been actively deregulating their natural gas and power markets for about 35 years now, and they've probably got another 35 to 70 years to go, given the, the, the general pace of, of uh, economic reform around regulated industries and the vested interests at work there, that it's highly unlikely LNG is going to be commoditized. Shipping, on the other hand, started off is sort of a black box in the LNG space. Nobody knew what went in or what came out, except a lot of cash disappeared and the cost of moving those $270 million 2000 vintage ships was very, very expensive. Since the LNG producers have moved out of the shipping space and turned it over really to the independent operators and owners, the introduction of, of tenders, of chartering, of spot chartering, the release back into the fleet of legacy tankers, which have many, many decades of useful life left in them, has really served to bring the market in a much sharper liquid focus, and we've seen the, re the net result on very transparent long-term and short-term charter rates on LNG tankers, which is much, and by the way, not huge divergences between them, much more representative of a commoditization move in that space. Thank you, Gordon. Appreciate that. Jerry, you have any follow-ups on that? Do you Sure, no, I, I absolutely agree with, uh, with the thesis. Um, LNG shipping um, is a commodity in itself, and we saw, um, uh, we saw a lot of it, or at least um, how it has, um, it has came about over the last couple of years. I think actually the, the high um, headline LNG prices of the, of the commodity, of the molecules, kind of uh, exacerbated uh, the issue as um, uh, in order for uh, energy companies and traders uh, to be able to uh, exploit uh, those uh, arbitrage opportunities, having access to shipping uh, has been very important. I would even argue that, uh, I would go a step further and I, I would say that two-stroke ships uh, became the holy grail uh, in, this, in this trade um, because uh, the high um, LNG price meant that uh, the, different, uh, the delta, let's say, in earnings uh, between a two-stroke ship and a steam ship uh, was for months on end uh, well above $250,000, and it might have reached uh, even $400,000, $450,000 per day. So having access to those ships meant a huge difference, especially in an environment where 
uh, you had uh, Contango. So a two-stroke ship is able to, um, to wait it out, let's say, uh, before discharge for a longer time because of its uh, uh, containment system and uh, uh, real leak capacity. Uh, it can also wait it out simply because discharge terminals in Europe were packed and uh, um, you needed um, a two-stroke ship uh, more than ever in order to be able to, um, let's say, face the new reality. So having access to those uh, two-stroke ships uh, became very important. The other thing that we saw was that, um, as I think uh, Michael alluded before, um, Many guys knew that they wanted to have access to shipping, but they also saw that they could um, um, use that ship in the meantime to reduce their, their cost of shipping going forward. So a trader or an energy company would, uh, um, would go out, uh, charter out a ship, maybe a year or two before their offtake started, and be able to charter it out at a higher rate and reduce uh, the average uh, cost. So um, definitely this is a trend that uh, we are uh, seeing very much of uh, right now. Um, and if, if I may, as a side note, of course, uh, I, it is true a quarter of, um, uh, only a quarter of um, the molecules uh, are traded uh, in the spot market. Most of it is on long-term contracts. And there were also destination clauses uh, in many of those uh, contracts that did not allow for buyers to resell uh, those cargoes. But I think we have seen a bit of retrenchment in that. And so last year, we saw very odd things. So we saw Australian cargoes coming to Europe uh, or Indonesian cargoes coming to Europe. But I think what was more interesting was uh, Chinese cargoes or uh, Korean cargoes uh, coming all the way to Europe, which meant effectively that the buyers went on to resell those cargoes. Again, this would, wouldn't be able, people wouldn't be able to do that without uh, the shipping, but it also shows that we have a gradual evolution into LNG becoming more of a commodity and behave like a commodity. Uh, very interesting. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that. Actually, with the, sp speaking specifically about the growth of the LNG market, um, I'll leave this to Richard. I'll send this question to you, Richard. Um, what do you see over the next 10 years with regard to the growth of LNG, the market itself? There's obviously a lot of movement. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, movement. I think a number which is often thrown out there is about a 60% growth by 2030. And uh, that is mainly going to come from the US, from Qatar, and from Mozambique. Uh, so the first two uh, places are you know, well, well known. Um, Mozambique is probably a, a new um, LNG, uh, source of LNG supply, um, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be huge. Yes. Uh, so those, those are the areas uh, which, which are the big areas. But um, I should also mention that maybe in the nearer term, we are seeing some smaller, more nimble operators, yes. uh, such as Golar, Yes. Uh, who are looking to bring volumes online um, also. So it'll be a combination. And um, what's going to drive the, the rate at which projects come online? Well, I think it's, it's clear that the fundamentals are there. And the uh, question is more about pulling the pieces together. And uh, that, if anything, is what is taking the time. And of course, in this market, with the EPC costs going up and uh, with the financing costs going up, um, contract levels for the offtake will have to adjust uh, for these projects to, to, to work. And it's the time that it takes for those types of uh, things to come together that will drive the, the rate, rate of new supply. Very good. Thank you, Richard. Yes, yeah, so, since you mentioned that, and since you mentioned Carlisle, Carl, would you like a follow up specifically about the growth of LNG or FLNG or yeah, 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 Mozambique? Sure. Yeah. So, so 10 years is a long time, but I think if, if you look at uh, what's sort of already under FID or under construction, uh, as Michael said, when we entered this year, we had just over 400 million tons of, of liquefaction capacity. Between now and 2030, we're expected to add another 150 before incremental growth. And 65% of that growth is, to Richard's point, coming out of the US. This increase in 150 million tons still only increases LNG from 3 to 5% of the global energy mix. So if you take the environmental attributes of LNG plus the flexibility of LNG as a flexible 
base load support for renewable growth expansion. We believe that this market has way more capacity to grow. If we truly want to replace more uh, dirty fuels like Brent and coal, we should facilitate build out of L LNG. And for us, I think it's far more of, of a supply constraint rather than a demand constraint. And to, to Michael's point, at some price, all gas flows. So it's really a relative pricing of LNG versus the alternative fuels. And thank you for, for the reference to FLNG. That's why we at Golar focus for mainly African LNG projects. Uh, the reason being is that in a liquefaction project, you have three cost drivers. The cost of lifting the gas, the cost of liquefying the gas, and the shipping distance to the end user. In Africa, you have proven gas reserves where you can lift the gas at around a dollar. So you have anywhere from a 30 to a 90% cost of advantage over US export projects. Our liquefaction technology is cheaper to construct than building a shore-based liquefaction plant in the US. So cheaper lifting cost, cheaper liquefaction cost. And it's difficult to argue that West Africa is closer to both end users in Europe uh, and Asia than US will ever be. So if you have a business with three cost drivers and you're cheaper on all three counts, we think we're well positioned to take our part in being slightly more nimble than some of the majors to boost the output and to diversify energy sources, not only away from Russia, but also increments to Qatar and, and uh, the US. So that's why, what we're focused on. Very good. Thank you, Carl. Very interesting. I appreciate that. And speaking of production, so there's a lot of production coming online and a lot of potential as well. But what about from the shipping side? You know, if you look at specifically, we have 720 LNG car carriers in operation and 204 on order. So this question I'll turn to Jerry. Um, is that enough? with the project projected production and demand? Um, that's, uh, that's a great question. If anything, um, I would say in a nutshell, um, it doesn't look like it. Um, probably today, if you look at the LNG fleet, that's over 40,000 cubes. Um, that's um, slightly fewer ships, maybe uh, 650 or so. Uh, of course, the order book has also increased. Uh, today, the order book uh, must be closer to 300 ships on order. Um, and I would say uh, it's a very good thing that it's there because demand, um, as um, Richard pointed out, is going to come from um, the new liquefaction capacity. Um, and if you look just at the projects uh, that have uh, taken FID, including uh, the recently announced uh, phase two plug uh, project of uh, Venture Global, you probably, uh, that will probably translate into demand for around 250 ships, assuming that half of, this, of the cargoes um, end up in Europe and the other half in Asia. Now, of course, there are numerous other projects uh, out there that are at different stages um, of uh, permits. But if you look at those that, uh, let's say, have, uh, um, they, they have taken at least uh, some permits uh, in place and then um, and or have sold um, some of their volumes under SPAs, that could translate to demand for another 400 chips. Now, I'm not arguing that all of them are going to materialize the next five years, um, but you can understand that even a fraction of those uh, uh, materializes, and um, I think we should be accepting, expecting more FIDs over the next uh, few quarters. We can uh, very easily get to the 300 chips that are on order today. And that's, of course, without taking into account um, fleet attrition, we have at least 50 steam ships that are going to be more than 25 years of age over the next four years. And if you see that from the perspective of new regulation, CEXI, CII, um, the impact uh, of those regulations is going to be fairly heavy on uh, those uh, older generation ships. Uh, it will require specific speeds, um, very high utilization from uh, uh, commercial operators to be able to make uh, sense and deploy those vessels. So I think we'll probably see more of these uh, vessels over the next few years as exiting the fleet. So uh, 
in, in an environment where you have this type of demand fundamentals, um, um, older generation ships um, exiting, and then finally a very finite uh, capacity um, for new ships in terms of shipbuilding. I mean, right now, Korea and China, they are full at least uh, until the second half of uh, 2027. I think we are uh, in a market that looks uh, very tight indeed uh, going forward. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it. Very insightful. So, Gordon, I'd like to, would you like to do a follow-up? I'd actually like to see what um, the research that you guys have done and what your um, numbers are showing. Well, I think the fundamental question on, on shipping demand is where's the market going to be and where's the supply going to come from? And obviously, I think we are, at this point, in terms of major additions to supply, it's a two-horse race. It's the U.S. and Qatar. Uh, Qatar was ahead, the U.S. is pulled in front, and now they're galloping down the back straight, and it's probably the U.S. is going to pull well ahead before Qatar then catches up once again with the big expansion underway right now. But I think more fundamental, and, and those are reasonably certain. You know, you don't have to be a highly paid analyst to figure out where the LNG is coming from, because if it's not in construction, it's highly unlikely as much of it's going to get here by 2030. The more intriguing question is where the demand is going to come from. Uh, if it comes from Europe, which is of, of what a lot of people are betting on, then obviously the need for ships, i.e. to get from the U.S. to Europe, is a lot lower than it would be to get from the U.S. to Asia. But I think the European market is a huge wild card, a big question mark, because of the drive to eliminate hydrocarbons basically from Europe by 2040. And if you've got an LNG project that starts its first deliveries in 2028, you can't quite make the numbers add up to the financing and offtake requirements against the European regulations of the standard eight. Something has to give. And it may well be that the volume gives. The other big un uncertainty is the long haul trades out of the US into, into Japan, Korea, Taiwan are very much in a, in a mature level. And there's not a lot of sight line to big economic, to big growth of LNG demand in those core countries. So the demand's going to come from the emerging markets of China, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and that's also going to be a function of price. And those are price sensitive markets. Part of that, that diversion of cargoes from China to Europe this winter is because for some sellers in China, they're selling actually into very price sensitive markets. And when those buyers don't want LNG, they've, got, they've also coincidentally found a place to put it that worked out very well for everybody. But a lot of what saved Europe this winter was the reduction of Chinese demand in the face of high prices. So a lot of uncertainties. The final major uncertainty is what happens in Moscow. Uh, Putin won or Putin two. Uh, if we settle Ukraine, what is Moscow going to be motivated to do? They're going to sell LNG into Europe at very, very low price. I mean, sell gas into Europe at very low prices. All the infrastructure's there. There's a lot of European industry hurting from very high gas costs. It's hard to imagine that some additional volume of gas will not flow through those pipelines from maybe a rehabilitating Russia with the, with the uh, revenues potentially being diverted to reconstruct Ukraine. If that happens, then all bets really might be off because that would then f take a lot of LNG out of Europe, push it back to Asia where it has to compete in a more price sensitive environment. Thank you, Gordon. I'd like to pick up a little bit on that actually with regard to, to putting energy into Europe and, um, and I also want to kind of maybe tie it together with Jerry, what you mentioned, um, specifically about the FSRUs and actually the using the older tonnage and whether that could actually be repurposed and how it would be repurposed. Um, is there really potential for that? Um, is there a need for that? Um, with that, I actually, or if, if you see a different uh, take on it, as a matter of fact, Carl, I'd like for you to start that um, conversation. So, so Golar was the first in the world to ever build an FSRU, yes. to ever convert. So we know a bit about that. So, but, but if you take... Are FSRU's conversion going to save uh, the, the LNG carriers? I think you need to look at the relative scale. So LNG carriers is now more than 700 vessels on the water and an order book of closer to 300. The total FSRU count in the world is 45. So by scale, uh, yes, you can see some of the older steamers be converted to FSRU's. If 
for whatever reason, there's a fundamental soft spot on LNG carriers. We definitely do not think that the amount of conversions is enough to offset whatever potential weakness. That said, I think when it comes to FSRU conversions, it would be mainly natural to think about the steam carriers, but you still have around more than 200 steam carriers that are facing an older uh, vintage that could be phased out of normal LNG trade. But it's, uh, the FSRU conversions is by no means enough to, to take off all of that. That said, we are also taking one or two of them to uh, FLNG conversions. We recently secured a right for a slightly older MOS design ship to be converted into an FLNG. Um, so that it's a potential, but it's not enough to offset any potential softness in, in LNG carriers. The other issue you have is, as Michael referred to, the optimal ship size is, is currently around 174 to 180 K in terms of the new builds. And most of the, the older ships that you could consider for conversion are way, way smaller. So also from just a cargo containment point of view, it's not uh, optimal offtake. So yes, you can see some FSRU conversions for smaller projects, but uh, not enough to, to offset any potential softness. Thank you, Carl. Very interesting. Richard, do you have, a, do you have an opinion on that? specifically about yeah, I, potential I, conversions? I agree with Carl, and I really don't think that the FSIU market is a particularly deep market. So it's not going to be a, um, a second, second life for, for, for many LNG carriers. There'll be a few uh, that, be, that are, are converted, but, but, but not that many. I don't think it matters so much from a shipping point of view, though, because these older LNG carriers are uh, commercially obsolete in any case. Uh, so they'll end up getting replaced by larger and uh, more, more efficient ships. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that. So I know we've had a lot of discussions about investment and financial um, uh, panels this morning, but I am actually interested in from, the, from your sp perspective. Um, from your perspective, what do you think the industry needs with regard to financing, specifically for your need? And, and quite honestly, we talked about ESG a little bit earlier and sustainability as well. Will that actually drive any of that? Is there, are the efforts that you're doing, um, to, is it being influenced by potential financing? And how do you, how do you see that? So with that, um, Gordon, I know in your book you did talk a lot about ESG on that. Where, where do you see that from, from your perspective with regard to financing and whether ESG will be influencing it? Well, I think the banks are facing some of the same tensions that the policymakers, the regulators, and industry participants are facing. What we have gone is we're not facing a dilemma. We're facing what I think BP characterizes as a trilemma. So we've got environmental considerations on the one hand. We've got affordability of energy on the other hand. And then at the top of the triangle, we suddenly placed energy security mm -hmm. in the wake of Ukraine. Yep. When you pull or emphasize one of them, you're going to then drive up the other two in ways that are unpredictable and can create all sorts of un unforeseen consequences. So a European drive for energy security will drive up price, and it will therefore, as particularly if you then try to maximize energy security and environmental benefit at the same time. I don't know how you do that without clearly to the detriment of pricing. And I think the banks are under the same kinds of pressures. And what the, the environmental opposition to LNG projects has begun to figure out is that rather than attacking oil companies who seem to have the, the hides of elephants or brontosauruses and, and really don't notice people throwing rocks at them because they've been doing it for decades, they're now attacking the regulators who are permitting these projects, and they're attacking the banks who are financing them. And right now, they've got, they're finding they're a little bit softer targets. So, so that, coupled with, I think, uncertainty around how regulators like the ACC are going to treat environmental disclosures by these institutions, is going to put pressure on the system, too. So no question that ESG is going to play a role in the financing, and it's going to put pressure, whether it comes in the form of just less capital available, banks leaving the sector, and frankly, margins going up for the banks that remain in it, just as they're going up for the oil and gas companies and the shipping companies that remain right. in the sector. Right. Thank you, Gordon. Would anybody else like to follow up on that? Carl, would you like to follow up? Uh, 
I can talk about what we're experiencing now. So uh, both LNG and nuclear was taken as part of taxonomy, especially the more energy efficient part of LNG production. And we see very strong interest from banks, both traditional shipping banks, uh, Asian, say, leaseback counterparts, and to some extent for their long term cash flow visibility, uh, also US private placement and the terminal market here. So at least what we experience, and I'm pretty sure that echoes through the panel, that we see very strong interest from financiers for LNG. Yep. Right, thank you very much. So I do want to follow up on a little bit on sustainability, because I do think um, there is, there is a, a partnership or collaboration that we spoke about earlier. Um, and this one I'll give to Richard. Richard, this will be for your question. How can LNG vessel owners, charters, and other value chain stakeholders, including terminals and port authorities, collaborate toward decarbonization goals? Yeah, and that's a, a good, good question. Uh, I think when it comes to improving on the environmental performance of the LNG transportation industry, uh, you've got to look at the, at the details. And uh, you know, yes, there are some kind of moonshot ideas out there, but um, there's a lot that can be done uh, with existing technology. And uh, it's worth at least 15 or 20 percent uh, in terms of emissions re reductions. And what am I talking about here? I'm talking about things like fitting subcoolers and reliquefaction to, to vessels. That's uh, something which is on the newer vessels, and it's one of the reasons why charters like them. Charters like them because of the propulsion as well, but they like them especially because of the fact they can relic. And uh, that is something which in this LNG market is key, given the seasonality of the market, especially in Europe. So if you have something like a subcooler fitted to a vessel, uh, your environmental performance goes up enormously. Uh, you can then add things like ALS. Um, just by working closely with the charters, you can save a surprising amount of LNG and fuel. Uh, so our focus is very much to do what we can using things which are readily attainable today. And uh, that's going to be worth 15 to 20% in emissions reductions over the next, uh, call it, five years. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that. Jerry, I'll turn to you for a follow-up. Is there, is there more need for collaboration, or is it very specific? So I, I think you uh, hit the, the nail right on the head. Um, there is a need for collaboration all around, and I would argue even beyond uh, just um, uh, terminals um, and charters. I mean, you need, um, uh, you need obviously engine makers, you need uh, shipbuilders, um, you need everybody in the cycle to, to play along. And that starts from how you frame the question and what do you measure. First of all, the industry needs to move um, away from uh, the tank to wake uh, approach. Uh, as um, Michael pointed out earlier on, there is uh, a methane emission issue. We shouldn't hide from it. Um, so um, a well to wake um, is uh, probably the right approach. And I think both the EU and the IMO will go in that direction. Um, secondly, we have to measure uh, CO2 equivalents and not just CO2. Um, uh, that would include uh, methane. Um, again, um, the EU has said that in their ETS um, um, uh, program, uh, they will take into account um, other greenhouse emissions, and I think that's the, the, right, uh, uh, the right direction. Because it, w it is only then that you'll be able to create a virtuous circle. So uh, for us, for example, we have in our latest series of uh, new buildings. They have a different set of propulsion with mega engines and uh, soft generators. We have all our new builds um, um, equipped with uh, emissions monitoring systems. We have retrofitted some of those in our existing ships. But in order for this investment to pay out, you need um, also uh, for the right measurement and then the right market-based measures that will give us a return on our investment. Because it is only when a charterer has greenhouse emissions and the right greenhouse emissions, CO2 so equivalents in their PNL, that they will be able to reward owners that have ordered the right ships with the right uh, technology. And if owners are then able to uh, pay for the right technology, then you will support R&D going forward and then create this uh, virtue circle. So it needs the collaboration of everybody involved, um, and it's only then that you will create uh, the virtue circle that will get you to net zero. Very, very well said, Jerry. That's very nice. 
So it does look like we're kind of running out of time and we're getting close to lunch. So I think what I'll do um, is maybe do a final question for each of the panelists and we'll keep it high level. We'll give a nice um, a summary of where you think the industry is going. So I'll ask the question from your perspective, what are the two or three most um, significant challenges that the LNG sector is going to see going forward? This, the sector as a whole or the shipping? Well, I said, I'm sorry. I should have said LNG shipping. <laughs> I, I think number one, it's the order book. Yeah. Number two is the distance. Is the volumes going to, to Europe or to Asia? Because it's twice the vessel demand. Uh, and then lastly, it's probably LNG price compared to alternative fuels. So the overall demand. Yeah, That's my three, three points. Very good. Gordon? Well, I, th I think the challenge near term is making sure that we have, we maintain the flexibility to meet these these very volatile swings in supply and demand that we've we've seen over the last two years. Longer term, I think the real challenge is going to be decarbonization, and that's going to affect shipping just as much, and maybe more so than other elements, which might actually lend themselves to more readily to decarbonization than shipping does. But that's not a unique problem for LNG shipping. It's a problem for all shipping. Thank you, Gordon. Richard? Yeah, I'd agree with Gordon on um, matching the uh, performance of the ships and the environmental performance, especially to the evolving nature of the trades. Uh, that, that's something which uh, is, is a challenge. Uh, I think the other one that I would add is the fact that when you order a ship now, it arrives in 2027. And to put money down today for a ship which is not going to arrive until 2027 is, is tough. It's a long time to wait. And that, uh, that, is, uh, that is a problem for the sector. Very well said, Richard. And Jerry, how about some final comments? What is your, from your perspective? Uh, I think the high LNG prices, uh, the commodity prices of uh, last year, um, while they created a lot of volatility and arbitrage opportunities, uh, which was good for shipping overall, um, long term they're a negative. Um, there is some de demand destruction going on, and I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. Look at, you know, today if a so ship owner is thinking of ordering a DF ship, a dual fuel ship, you know, they will say, well, LNG, it might be too expensive in the future. So there is some demand destruction there. And hopefully with the normalization of LNG prices, that will be helpful. And the other thing that I would highlight is uh, also uh, OPEX increases inflation, but uh, especially finding crews uh, for this huge LNG fleet is going to be a challenge going forward. Um, it's a, it's a, one of us that has resources or for training uh, crews so will have to do it, but I think it's going to be unavoidable that we will see some more inflation creeping up in OPEX. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Really appreciate that. So with that, I would like to thank you. I'd like to thank um, Capital Lincoln City for uh, giving me an opportunity to moderate the panel. I'd like to thank you, the audience. Um, so please join, in, uh, join me in thanking Michael and our panelists. <laughs> and I hope all of you have a very good afternoon. Thank you.